chapter number 6 and verse number 24. The Bible said, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. Therefore, or because of this saying I just gave you, I say this to you. Take no thought for your life what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment. Behold the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? Why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field. How they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you little faith? Take therefore no thought. Therefore, take no thought. Say what we'll eat. What do we drink? What are we going to be clothed with? For after all these things do the Gentiles say, For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. What a scripture, what a passage here that we find Jesus given in the word of the Lord. And uh, it starts out, no man can serve two masters. You're going to hate one, love the other, hold one, despise the other. And, and, and a lot of times people have taken, I have, and it is nothing wrong with that, I'm just, I'm just making a point here. A lot of times people will take that one verse out, verse 24, and they'll preach that one verse. You know, about who you serve and how you serve him. But verse 24 is tied to verse 25 through verse 34 because Jesus tells us we can't serve both. And then he said, therefore, because you can't serve both, I'm going to give you this parable here, this saying. I'm going to preach this to you, Jesus said. And I'm preaching this to you because you can't serve two masters. What this is, and I apologize that I may not have all the most flowery vocabulary. But for lack of a better term, Jesus is making a sales pitch mm -hmm. about serving the Lord. You can't serve both, he said. And he don't tell us anything about what might happen to us if we serve the other one in this setting. But he said, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. And he begins to tell us what things can happen if we serve the Lord. We can't serve both. And so if there's a decision, when, 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 you, when you have two choices here, we can serve God or mammon. We can serve God or the devil and or evil or, 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 uh, or, or good. We have two options here. And because of that, Christ begins this, this what I'm going to call a, a, a sales pitch. Because I think that's a term we can understand. He begins a sales pitch for why you should serve God. Now by the time you start that in verse 25, you already know you can't have both. And, and, and boys, I'm telling you, by the time you get to verse 34, it's obvious to me I don't need another choice. How about you? Amen. Amen. When you get to verse 34, and he stops, and then he goes into the seventh chapter, would you have stopped him, raised your hands, and flagged him down and said, that's good, but I'd like to hear the warranty policy on serving mammon if you don't mind. I'd like to, you to expound a little bit on what, by how things be if I serve Him. It sounds so good that there's no reason for a second choice. If Jennifer was getting ready to make us some supper, and she called and said, Do you want a glass of cold chipmunk sweat, some boiled hen's tea, 
and a pickled pig's foot. <laughs> or you, you can't have both. You can have a glass of cold chipmunk sweat, some bold hen steam, and a pickled pig's foot. Or I can make grilled pork chops, cream spinach, fresh corn on the cob, fried okra, and hot rolls. Yeah. And by the time she got through with that discourse, I don't need to go back to choice one again, do you? <laughs> I know, I know, I know that's a big, a big, a big a chasm there between those two. But I don't need choice one. I don't need to go back here and find out about serving mammon. I don't need to go back and find out what it's like to serve the devil. I like verse 25 through verse 34. And he says, take no thought. Again and again and again and again. In this chapter, in this passage here, he tells us, you don't even have to worry about tomorrow when you serve this God. Amen. The sparrow don't have to worry. The lily don't have to worry. The raven don't have to worry. The, 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 nothing else has. You don't even have to worry about your clothes. Now, we've got to write it back word the truth. And so, so let's dig just a minute before we go preaching. Take no thought what you shall eat. So that must mean no grocery list. No shopping. Just sit home because God's going to provide. Eventually a beefsteak's going to fall out of heaven. And a little bowl of gravy's going to come out with it. But we don't have to think about it. And take no thought what you shall wear. Somebody asked me the other day, said, I'm looking for a church where I can go and not be judged. That's always, you know. <laughs> I let them know they come here and not be judged, but just in case. You know, you don't know, folks. I said, I do take a firm stand and a no-nonsense stand. One man, one woman. I don't believe in two men, don't believe in two daddies, don't believe in two mommies. Oh, we're not like that. That's what no. <laughs> I mean, I didn't want him to know this is a safe place, but there are some judgments here. <laughs> the Bible commands us to judge between good and evil. Yeah. You make decisions every day. Yeah. If you didn't, why do you have a puppy dog for a pet instead of a gorilla? <laughs> There's decisions that have to be made. We judge things. It's not a sin to judge. <laughs> we go right into the seventh chapter, judge not that you be not judged. But with what judgment you need, so it's telling us you aren't going to judge. You just remember somebody's going to judge you back. Yes. Mm -hmm. The man went on to say, I, I, you know, he didn't have a suit. Can he just come to church and what he had on? I said, I'll tell you how I feel. I'll tell you where my judgment's at. I want you to come to church but just wear clothes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Amen. I ain't going to tell you what brand and what color. I just want you to wear some clothes. If you come to God's house and something God don't like, God can tell you about it. It's His house. And He ain't a deaf mute. When, when Sister Tanya told me that day she wouldn't come to church, she might not have appropriate clothes. I remember this house and said, I my clothes. I said, just wear some clothes and come on. I mean, I don't care if you come to church in your house coat. Just come to church. When this scripture said, take no thought about your clothes, that don't mean just get up in your underwear and head out and expect God to put something on you before you meet your neighbor on the road. Yeah. That's not what he's talking about. God expects us to dress. God expects us. Or God don't expect it. I expect it when we go to Walmart. We ought to have a little bit of an idea of what we're here for. We do not have to go down every... I'll never know my grandma got dementia. And how she shopped and she went to Walmart and started on this end. She went all the way to this end. And then she went all the way back and all the way back. Sometimes you do that two or three times. And she didn't even know she'd been on them aisles before. And she'd see you on this aisle down here. Didn't see you down there. Talk to you like she had never seen you in 20 years. Sometimes, Sister Jennifer don't have to mention, but sometimes I ask her, you know, are we doing the nanny deal today? Or do we have a relative idea of what we're coming to town for? Take no thought. But I tell you what Jesus is trying to tell them is, you don't have to go to bed tonight thinking, oh God, I probably ain't going to have nothing to eat tomorrow and I ain't going to have a house tomorrow. Now, I tell you that the future, the future's not in the Bible. The word future's not in the Bible. And we worry over it more than we worry over anything else at all. Something that's not even in here. Now, tomorrow's in the Bible and morrow, but M-M-O-R-R-O-O-W is in there not tomorrow, but a lot of times it says on the morrow. It's the same thing. That's in the Bible. 
Bible 101 times. There's more thought goes into future things than there is anything else in the world. Yes. There's more of you sitting here tonight with knots in your stomach over tomorrow than anything else in the world. There's more anxiety and more depression, more, more, more oppression. There's more problems over the future than there is anything else in the world. And you've got more chance of sprouting wings and flying to St. Louis and back tonight than you do change in the future. It ain't even here yet. And Jesus said, what in the world are you worried about? It ain't even got here yet. You're already in a fence. Amen. Help him, God. Take no thought for the morrow. The morrow will take thought for the things of itself. I will know tonight how many of you sit here and, and, and I, know for, I know for sure that there are several that are not here tonight that are wherever they are are worrying over things on the morrow. I know. I know for sure that Brother Junior, that Granny is, and I'm not bashing her. I'm just saying that if I speak to go in for some test she's going in for, I'd be thinking about it too. It's human nature. Yeah. Come on tonight. That's why Jesus dealt with it. Because he knew that we were going to deal with it. Yes. What would have been the point of him preaching something nobody was ever going to think about? Right. But all those years ago, he stands before these people and tells them to be careful about getting over anxious about tomorrow. And here we are tonight. And sometimes we can't have church on Thursday for you worrying over Friday. And we can't have church on Sunday for you worrying over Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. Yes. The moral. The moral. The moral. 99% mm -hmm. of human worries spent on the future. That's right. Yes. Sister Carolyn's got things coming up at the doctor. Brother Junior requests prayer on Sunday night. I, I am not... I am not knocking it at all. I'm a little worried about tomorrow. Myself, I'm worried about getting the washer and dryer hooked up or you're fixing to think I'm like Lazarus by now I stink it. <laughs> Come on, we're running out of our ears. I'm a little worried about getting the well hooked up out there because if we don't, I won't have a house and no water. We're going to be down there in the ponds just, you know, do the best we can. I ain't telling you I don't worry over tomorrow. I'm telling you Sunday night where the junior's prayer request was, I got a doctor's appointment coming up someday this week, and I, got, and I want you to pray about that. Yes. And Sister Carolyn's got a prayer request about a doctor's appointment coming up at the end of this week, and she's got another prayer request about another doctor's appointment that hasn't even been made yet and don't even know when it can get made. Yes. Here we are at 8 o'clock at night on Thursday night. And not very long from now, most of you will be in the bed. And one of the last thoughts in your mind is going to be over tomorrow. We spend more time fretting over tomorrow. And it occupies so much of our time that we accomplish nothing today. Help him, God. Because we're too busy worrying over tomorrow. Help him, God. And Jesus said, I tell you, don't take any thought for that. And then again, what, what, what one of you can take thought and add to his stature a cubit? And what one of you can change the color of your hair by this thing you've done? I tell you what you'll do. You can change the color of your hair by worrying over tomorrow. Yes, that's right. You hear me? You can't change your white hair black. Maybe like Jesus talked about. But you can turn your black hair white. Yes, you can. Worrying over tomorrow. Yes, you can. Here's what I know tonight. Am I ever concerned about the future? Of course I am. And I think that's why Jesus dealt with this. When he says take no thought, he's not meaning that we just, you, you, have, I made, have I made the point there? I mean, if you know good and well, you don't have any milk. He's not saying don't ever even think about buying any and hope to God that a gallon will just come floating out of the sky. You're going to need to get some milk. Yeah. But be not over anxious, overburdened about tomorrow. 
I've prayed through the week this week, and, I, and, and I'm not, I mean, maybe I, maybe I am more than I think I am. I don't, but I don't feel like I'm preaching to me right now. I'm not all that worried about this house deal. The Lord's working it out. Yes. It, it ain't happening just like I want, just when I want, and everything ain't been as smooth as I want it to be, but it's happening. Yes. I ain't going to bed in the street tonight. Yes, Lord. Come on here. You're not either. You said, Brother Justin, you don't know what I'm worried about. I prayed through the week. I said, Lord, and this went over and over and over and over. I felt it and I felt it. And I thought, Lord, that's so that's so elementary. And it's just so, you know, I'd like to preach you something that you just say, wow. <laughs> I mean, I'm dazzled by the word he come up with that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'd like to. I'm a I got some stuff I'm working on. I'm ready to preach it to you. But I felt like going out here tonight. And, and, and here's what I felt. So I got you a Bible verse so you wouldn't fall out with me. Mm -hmm. But really, I come tonight so to talk to us from the new book. <laughs> I read you some words of red here that Jesus said. But I'd like to talk to you in the red back hymnal for just a minute. Can I do that? This is what's on my heart. I prayed about your appointments, Brother Junior. This is what's on my heart. I prayed about all that, Sister Caroline. I could drive through dirt yesterday. And, and I told, I believe it was yesterday, and I told Jennifer, I said, well, I'm worried about that. The old Sister Carolyn, back of her head. And praying about that. Seeking the Lord about that. I'm wanting God to move where she don't ever need a surgeon. That's right. Yes. I don't want her to have to have that. No. You may have prayed about that with me. Yes. 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 I've been praying. I had hardly ate a meal. The last two or three weeks that I haven't prayed over my meal more for the Lord to bless Sister Barb to eat than I have prayed for the Lord to bless it to my body. I've been worried over Sister Barb. I've been worried over Tanya. She's grieving. I've watched my mother-in-law walk that road of grief and a lot of other people have too. And, and, and we're, we're doing our best to help her navigate through that. She's had sickness and nerves and just up and down and sideways and and uh, and this and every time I pray for Sister Bar right here, and every time I pray for Sister Tanya right here, and I pray about for Sister Gail. I called you other morning, let you know I was praying for you. And I thought when I was driving by the house. I, I thought I'd let Jennifer call her. And I don't, I don't just call her church women all the time. But but the Lord said you're a pastor, and you're a pastor. And so I rung Sister Gail up early one morning. I, I said I want you to know I'm praying for. Yeah. She lost her friend, and I'm praying about that. And, and I've been praying for Brother Chuck and his back situation. Well, there's a, we, I'll tell you, we've got needs in the church. Yes. Mm -hmm. Praying for Brother Paul's deal. Yes. And, and praying that if God don't heal him, that they can hurry up and get a defibrillator for him, get it fixed, get him some help. Yes. I'm praying for this right here. I keep coming to page 259. And it says, Dread not the things that are ahead, the burdens great, the sinking sand, the storms that o'er the path are spread. God holds the future in His hands. Yes. Woo! We know not what tomorrow hides, but sun or storm of good or ill, we only know His dear hand guides, and He will be our Father still. His hand created earth and sky. Help him the zephyrs and the storms that rage. Years to come and years gone by. To Him are but an open page. Live close to Him and trust His love. Assured that while on earth we roam, whatever may come, He bends above to guide His children safely home. God holds the future in His hands. And every heart he understands, on him depend. He is your friend. God holds a future in his hands. Every time I pray about it, I keep coming back. God, God. holds a future in his hands. Yes. If Sister Barb do eat better more, God holds a future in his hands. What about Sister Karen and the, and the neurology of God? Again, 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 all through this week. I 
keep coming back to page 259. Yeah. God holds the future in his hands. Yes. We gathered around Sister Phyllis's bed that day, Sister Gail, and your heart was so heavy, and I knew it was. And we got praying, and the good Holy Ghost come in there, and we sung to her. I was praying, Lord, to heal her body, but I never could feel like that was really what was going to happen. I just, every time I pray it, I just kind of feel like veering off over here. I pray about it, and I'm veering back off. After a while, I stood up at the foot of that bed, and I said, Sister Phyllis, there's going to be a resurrection. Oh, and that Holy Ghost coming in there. Oh, I said, I'm hoping Sister Phyllis, I said, I need she's to go going home. And what's going to happen? I don't know. God holds the future. I'm telling you, come to me for answers. I can just give you this answer. God.
and we know his hand created earth and sky. The seabirds and the storms have raged, and years to come and years gone by are just to him an open page. So live close to him and trust his love. Assure that while on earth we roam, whatever they come, he bends above, just to guide his children safely home. I tell you tonight, the years to come and the years gone by yes. are an open page to God. Yes. He sees the day of creation like he sees the day of the rapture. Oh, yes, sir, brother. Woo! What we're worrying over, because I can't even see 9 o'clock tonight. I sure can't see 9 o'clock in the morning. And oh, sometimes the knots get in my stomach and they churn and they twist like an old rug board with a wash going up and down and just churning and twisting. But the years that have been and the years that shall be to God an open page I can't even see the next chapter he already declared the end from the beginning hallelujah sister Jean however many years ago the polio came so long back you'd be about the only one left around probably that can remember that happening so long ago. We don't know how many years left, but for God, an open page. One page. And whatever may come, He bends above to guide His children safely home. I come tonight with a little message of hope. I, I know I feel, I feel a little weird about it too, and I guess maybe you do. I'm preaching out a songbook. But, but man, I tell you, it's been on my heart. God yes, holds yes. the future in His hands. Yes. I prayed about some things this week. I prayed about things for people in this church and people in other churches that's asked me to pray about things. And every time I go to prayer this week, I feel it again. God holds the future in His hands. I trust that man. I trust Him implicitly. He never makes a mistake. As you navigate the uncertainties, Sister Tanya, and the firsts, as you navigate the changes, there's going to be those things that come and you would like to call for Him to fix that. See about that. And as you navigate all that, and those moments of loneliness come, remember, he holds the future in his hands. Yes, he does. My mother-in-law told me the other day, she said, I know where she's at. But she said, there's been a lot of times I said, God, Calvin ain't here to ask. And I can't fix this. I'm a woman. I don't know what to do. I need you to help me. She said, sometimes I've done things that a little old widow woman shouldn't have been able to do. Because God did it for me. I come to tell you, Brother Junior, whatever comes tomorrow, yes. whatever those doctor's visits bring, God holds the future in His hands. Brother Brad, God holds the future in His hands. So secure in the hands of God. So safe. So perfectly held. God holds it in His hands. Let me get it one more time. Let's stand. She's getting ready to sing. There's one little phrase right here I want to pick one more time. We know not what tomorrow hides. Sun, storm, good, ill. Brother Chuck, we don't know. We only know his dear and guides. And he will be our father still. What consolation. What hope. I tell you, I can go to bed tonight and lay my head on that pillar and I can rest like a baby because tomorrow he'll be my father. And whatever I encounter tomorrow, I can rest tomorrow night because I know 
Yes. But the next day, he'll still be my father. That's right. Oh, that's right. God holds the future yes, in his yes. hands. Amen. Maybe that don't help you. I'd like to send you home tonight under orders from Christ. Not me, but orders from Christ. Take no thought over the mark. Don't worry over it. Don't stress over it. Don't let tomorrow eat today's lunch. Don't break out in hives today over tomorrow. Don't fret yourself into the bed sick tonight over tomorrow night. It hadn't even gone here yet. I, I, I'm just giving you the same advice. You know what they say is good for a goose is good for the gander. If it's good for Jesus' disciples, it's good for ours. So I, I admonish you in Christ's stead tonight. Consider the flowers. Consider the sparrows. Look, look at all the things about us in what we call nature. Look how it's going. Are you not much more valued than many sparrows? I, I guess the little sparrow had a heat stroke. I reckon I had her on the porch the other day. Just a little bitty guy. He hadn't been there long. He wasn't stiff at all. Picked him up, and it was on one of those hottest days. I, I saw him laying there. Jennifer said, what's on the porch? I said, I, I think I know, but I'm not sure. I went over and I picked him up in my hand, laid him out there, and I, I rubbed his little chest. And once or twice, I thought his little eye fluttered. Brianna, being was standing there too, I think. Brianna said, Dad, I believe I'm about to breathe a little. I kind of used my finger, popped his chest, tried to jumpstart his little heart. <laughs> I said, come on, little buddy, let's live. Come on, little fellow, let's live. I held him there, and I... I walked, I got his little wings and I moved him around. I worked his little feet. <laughs> I just wanted him to live. I just hate to see stuff die, you know. After a while, holding him, I thought when he hit the ground, somebody watched him. Hallelujah. Here I'm standing here holding him in my hand, knowing that seconds ago, the eyes of God was trained this very spot. And while I hold that sparrow in my hand, he's looking at me too. And he said, I'm much more valuable than many sparrows. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, take so he, he never did live. I never could bring him back to life. Maybe the Lord just knocked him out of the sky for my benefit. I don't know. But God saw him fall. Not one of them falls without your heavenly Father noticing that. Yes. Brothers and sisters, when things come to our lives, our good Father notices it. Yes, you guys. Mm -hmm. I, I'll tell you why. This right here, and I'm done, I promise. I'm done. <laughs> I'll tell you why Jesus said you don't have to worry over tomorrow. Two reasons. Number one, because he knew you couldn't do nothing about it anyway. Number two, because he's already taken care of tomorrow. That's right. He's already in your tomorrow. God's at 1037 tomorrow for you, 1118 for you, 417 for you, 1 o'clock sharp for y'all. He's already there. So why would you need to worry over it when that great God that rules the universe is already in my tomorrow? Why would I worry? Well, I wish to, I, I maybe ought to. I'm just preaching the best I know how. I'm trying to help us along here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm preaching you what I felt like the Lord gave me. And I know this, some of you sitting here, you're over anxious. Hear me. You're over anxious over tomorrow. You're burdened over tomorrow. God said, quit. Stop that. Sit back and breathe. Take it easy. Because I'm going to fix tomorrow for you. Thank the Lord. You don't have to worry about it. Let's pray.